Well, according to the calendar, it's Father's Day. And for some, this can be a day that's a little awkward and hard to navigate, especially if, say, your dad uh, just recently died, or you never had a really good relationship with your dad, or you're a dad and you don't have relationship, uh, a good relationship with your kids. It's kind of hard sometimes to, to navigate Father's Day. Then there's always the challenge of those men who always wanted to be a dad, but never had the opportunity. So Father's Day is a challenge, okay? Let, let's just say that up front. And perhaps one of the best things that we can do then to celebrate Father's Day uh, is to keep our focus <clears throat> on our Father in heaven. But if we do choose to, to, to celebrate, we have this dilemma, do we not? Which is, what's an appropriate gift for Father's Day? What do you get, Dad, for Dad's Day? Ties, neckties, you know, nobody wears them anymore. So that was the standard for years that you just buy dad a tie. But you don't do that anymore, okay? Because dad probably won't wear it. So what do you give dad for Father's Day? For years, we tried to provide a special day for dads at one church that I served at by canceling our regular Sunday services and, and doing a big outdoor service and doing events that dads could do with their kids where they could go fishing. There were live concerts. There were, we brought in race cars. We brought in helicopters. We brought in anything we could that we thought dads might enjoy sharing with their kids. Oh, and by the way, we did a lot of grilling too, okay? We grilled a lot of meat, okay? Because you can't have Father's Day without that. But you know, when we asked the dads who would come and those who didn't come and say, you know, what do you want for Father's Day? And they said, you know what? We really appreciate what you've done, okay? Don't, don't take this wrong. We really appreciate all of your efforts, but really what we want for Father's Day is nothing. We really don't want to do anything. If we want to go play a round of golf, we'll do that. If we want to just watch sports, if we want to just grill out or smoke some meat, or maybe we just want to sit in our chair and sleep. That's what we want for Father's Day. So it's hard to know what to get dads for Father's Day, but I think we still need to acknowledge those dads and, and say thank you for being, for, for at least trying to be the reflection of our Heavenly Father in the world that we live in today. So today, dads, thank you, okay? I add my gratitude, I, 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 I add my appreciation to all of you and what you've done. And uh, you know what? As difficult as it is to be a dad today, I, I think if you were to ask all of us who are dads, we would say that we wouldn't give it up for all the riches in the world. Now, we might give it up for a nice, thick, juicy steak, okay? <laughs> Fixed on the grill to perfection, but nowadays... <laughs> That steak costs all the riches in the world. So you know what? Maybe what we just need to do is to say happy Father's Day, okay, to all of you dads. And uh, thank you for sharing a part of your day with us. So today as we celebrate fathers, we also want to continue our study through the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians in a series that we're calling Connections. It's one of those books of the Bible that oftentimes just stays in the shadows, and now we're bringing it into the spotlight and trying to walk through it in order to gain as much wisdom as we can from the Apostle Paul and his relationship with this church in southern Greece. Paul spent a lot of time, okay, with this church and uh, a lot of energy making sure that they had this solid faith foundation and that they were really living the way that God wanted them to live. And I've asked repeatedly during this series, why was this relationship so important to Paul? Why were the Corinthian Christians so important that he would spend so much time and so much energy and effort with them? Well, today I want to give you, I think, part of the answer. I think there's more to it, and we'll get to that later, but I want to give you part of the reason why I think Paul's relationship with this church was so important. It's because he felt like a father to this church. And since it's Father's Day, I think it's only appropriate for us to reveal this part of their relationship and to look at where it comes from. For those who are dads, you know the responsibility that you feel for your kids, do you not? When they do something great, you say, hey, that's my kid. When they do something ridiculous and stupid, you say, my 
kid. There's a lot of responsibility, okay? We own that responsibility regardless of how our kids act. And in either case, we're proud of them because we take responsibility for being a part of what brought them into this world. The church in Corinth was birthed by the Apostle Paul. He, he started the church on his second church planting tour. He then went back at least two more times to visit them. And I can tell you this, as a, tr- as a former church planter, you never forget that experience of helping to start a church. All of the work that goes in on the front end. And then those first few years where you're just struggling to survive, hoping the Holy Spirit brings you people who need to hear the gospel. And then you are so, you feel so responsible for what happens in that church. Because you know maybe you had a little part to play in that church coming into existence. Well, the Apostle Paul, we know, started at least 14 churches. 14. (laughs) So he understood this feeling of being a father to this church in Corinth. I want to look at three passages today where I think that really comes out. The first is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to get there in a few few weeks, but let's just read it today. He says this, For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. Now, if you think about that, what he's saying here is, back in the old days, it was the father's responsibility to present his daughter as a virgin to her husband on the day of their wedding. He was to present her as pure and undefiled as possible. And that's exactly how the apostle Paul viewed his relationship with this church in Corinth and presenting them to to, uh, Christ. He spelled out this fatherly connection back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. If you go back to 1 Corinthians in chapter 4, verse, verse 15, he says this. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you only have one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So there it is. I think Paul sees himself as the spiritual father, and he tried very hard to make sure that this relationship, this connection that he had with his church was kept as pure as possible, which meant that all these accusations that are being waged towards him, he wanted to confront them, confront them head on as well. And he does that, I think, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. I, 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 I'll... When I get to the end of this passage, there's just something that just jumped out at me. I think that's so powerful. Verse 14 says this, I'm coming to you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you. I don't want what you have. I want you. After all, children don't provide for their parents. Rather, parents provide for their children. I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems the more I love you, the less you love me. Dads, can you relate to verse 15? The more I show my love for you sometimes, it just seems the less that you love me. Man, that's a verse that I think every dad needs to highlight or put on a wall someplace because it's real. The struggle is very real. You know, Paul viewed the Corinthians church as his spiritual offspring. And in providing this yet another defense for his ministry against his critics in chapter 4, I think he gives them some wisdom about what they can expect to happen to them. If they choose to follow in his footsteps and to share the gospel like he did. Last week, when we looked at chapter 3, we talked about the glory of God. And how someone with the spirit of God in them possesses this glory. And uh, Paul begins chapter 4, verse 1, with these words. He says, therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. Good message for dads, isn't it? Other translation says we never lose heart. 
each week during this series, I'm trying to, to just give a simple lesson that I think encapsul- encapsulates the, 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 the passage that's, that we can take with us and that we can remember. And this week, the, the, the lesson is the title of this message. All of us need to remember, never give up. Never give up. When it comes to following in Paul's footsteps and sharing Christ with others and being that that vessel that God's spirit shines through, never give up. One of the reasons I think that we don't give up is because Paul does give us some nuggets of wisdom in 2 Corinthians 4 that I, that I hope you can find very encouraging. So you've, I've given you the lesson. Now let me give you some wisdom statements this morning. The first one is this. The glory of God is in us. Just remember that. The glory of God is in us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. I, I'm using New Living Translation today if you're wondering what translation this is. First, or verse 7 of chapter 4 says this. We now have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. If you think about it, valuable things are placed in secure places, are they not? If you have valuables, you keep them in a safe. If you have valuable documents, you may put them in a safe deposit box. If you have lots of cash, what do you do with it? Well, of course, you put it in a jar and put it in the freezer or put it in your mattress, okay? Because nobody ever looks there nowadays. The irony of our situation is that God's glory is in us. It's by far the most valuable thing there is. So here we are, these fragile human beings, Paul says, carrying this invaluable treasure of God's glory. When's the last time you thought about what's in your body? Seriously, when's the last time you thought about that? And if you did, my guess is you probably talked about, oh, artificial sweeteners, nasty chemicals, too much sugar, You probably thought about all those things, but when was the last time you thought about the glory of God being in your body? As followers of Christ, we have something that is beyond (laughs) description and value, and yet what we'll want to do sometimes is to look at all of the things that we think shouldn't be there instead of what should be there. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told the story about a man who, when he found such a treasure, it was the kingdom of God back in Matthew, that he went and sold everything he had so that that treasure would be his sole possession. The glory of God in us is a, is a treasure that's not meant to be hoarded or kept to ourselves, but it's meant to be shared. And and the way that it's shared is when we're talking about Jesus and the good things that he's done for us, otherwise known as sharing the gospel, we're giving witness to the glory of God that is inside of us. You've probably heard or or read the illustration about when you put a light in in a sealed container. And I looked all over our house today and all I could find was a cookie jar, okay? Uh, but it, it will make the point, okay? This was my cookie jar that my mom got uh, that we inherited, and uh, the, it'll help make the point today. So if I put this light, which works, and I put it on in here like this, and all the lights were off and everything, because it is a solid container, except for maybe a little bit around the room, you wouldn't be able to see that light, would you? You can't see the light because this container is solid. It's sealed. There's no way for that light to get out. But let's say that this particular vessel becomes cracked and there's holes in it. Then you can begin to see the light. See, the reason that God put his treasure in us is because sooner or later, we're going to be broken. It happens we're no longer this perfect container that we want to be, that this light begins to escape out of us 
people are able to see God's glory, sometimes to the point where it looks like this. Making ourselves vulnerable and letting others see those flaws is never fun, and it's not easy. But you know what? It's the only way that we're ever going to let people see God's glory in us. Here's something that I find encouraging. Sometimes sharing the gospel isn't about what we say. It's about what we show, which is how much light of God is coming out of the cracks that are in our lives. On the other hand, if we're trying to convey this attitude to the world that we've got it all together and that our, our life is perfect, you know what? They're not going to see God in us. They may think we're a pretty good person, but God's not going to get any of the credit. So as followers of Christ, the glory of God is in us. And it will only shine forth unless we get in the way. That said, there are still going to be times when we do the right thing. We're transparent. We show our flaws. We show all of those uh, imperfections in our lives. And we're going to talk to people. They're going to see it. And they're still not going to respond. And we're going to begin to get very frustrated by that. So there's another, another nugget of wisdom that I think Paul gives to us in chapter 4 that says this. When that happens, the enemy of God blinds certain people. I think we need to remember the enemy of God blinds certain people. Now, I don't know about you, but I sure would love to know who those people were ahead of time. <laughs> it would make it so much easier to know who Satan has blinded to hearing the gospel message. Because what happens is we try and we try and we try. We bang our heads against the wall. And sooner or later, we think it's our fault. We're not doing something right. When what's happened is <laughs> the message of Paul to the Ephesians in chapter 6 needs to be remembered when he says, you know what? We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in the dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's chapter four. Chapter 6, verse 12 of the book of Ephesians. So as Paul's spiritual offspring, let's read what he says has happened sometimes when we try to walk in his footsteps. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, verse 3, says this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Why are they perishing? Verse 4. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness, likeness of God. You may have tried for years to share Christ with someone You've tried every way that you can think of to share the gospel, and there's just no receptivity to that message. I don't know about you, but for me, it's a little liberating to read chapter 4. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, never give up. When you get to chapter uh, 4, verse 4, it's a little liberating to think, you know what? It's not me that's the problem here. It's the fact that Satan has put a veil. He's blinded them. From being able to even comprehend what we're saying. When that happens, God will probably show us another way that his glory can shine through us. Maybe it's a new crack that will form that will allow his light to come out. Or maybe it's a new posture that we assume. One like Ephesians chapter 6 where we're on our knees praying more than in their face saying more. What if we're on our knees praying more instead of in their face saying more? You see, when we realize that it's Satan that we're up against, and it's not just our own inadequacies and, and their re, you know, lack of, of receptivity, we're going to realize that, you know what, the only way this door is going to be opened if, is if God does it, not us. I'm not spiritually strong enough most days to battle Satan head on. 
and remove blindfolds. I don't know if you are. I'm not. So the most powerful posture for a Christian has been known for centuries. It's on your knees. And yet, what do we do? We try so hard to use our wisdom and our strength to fight against Satan. And people remain blind to the gospel. Is there someone today that you've been trying to share Christ with for years? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a friend. And you just hit the proverbial wall. If that's the case, then tap into Paul's wisdom today and accept the fact that Satan may have blinded that person. And the only way you're ever going to get through to them is for you to spend more time on your knees in prayer asking God to remove the veil that Satan has placed there. You see, that's the only way that they're going to be able to see God's glory in us is if God takes the veil away. So sometimes Satan blinds to keep people from seeing the glory of God in us. But there's a third nugget of wisdom that I think Paul gives to us today. And it's one that we don't like to think about, but it is reality. It's a fact that somehow, some way, when we carry the glory of God inside of us, and if we're trying to follow Paul's example, Satan is going to do something to hinder our efforts. He's going to try to deter us in some way. Now, what I'm talking about here is, is persecution, okay? And, and let's be very real. <laughs> we have never, nor will we probably ever, experience any persecution because of our faith that even comes close to what the Apostle Paul experienced. So here's what we have to remember. The experience of suffering only magnifies God's eternal glory. The experience of suffering only magnifies God's eternal glory. I don't know about you, but I don't like to suffer. <laughs> I don't like when I have a cold. I don't like when I get an infection. But you know what? Being in pain is never pleasant, and sometimes it brings out the worst in us, does it not? Here's where we can flip the entire picture, though. I think and begin to view suffering as a good thing and not a bad. After Paul's conversion, we know that he suffered a great deal. You can read about some of those things, and we're going to read about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He experienced beatings and floggings and stonings and shipwrecks. And he said, all of this was because I've chosen to allow the glory of God to ooze out of my body. Today, instead of looking at those specific sufferings, let me just try to find the good that comes when we suffer or when Christians are persecuted. Look with me at chapter 4, verse, beginning in verse 8. There's going to be a number of things that I think will pop out at us here at the text. Verse 8 says this, we are pressed on every side by troubles. Remember, we're clay jars, and we're still being pressed on every side. What happens when clay jars are pressed? They're broken, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. There's part of it, I think, is that when we share in the death of Christ, people are going to see the life that he's given to us. But let's keep reading, okay? Verse 11. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. So being willing to suffer a little bit can bring eternal life to some other people. That's a good reason. But I think there's still more. Look at verse 13. He says, but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise with Jesus uh, and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. 
And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. So through suffering, God reaches more people. There's more thanksgiving. God receives more glory. I I, I think he kind of brings it all to a head here. He kind of comes to to the top of the peak here, beginning in verse 16, when he says this. This is why we never give up. Oh, man, have you ever wanted to just give up? But Paul says, this is why we don't give up. Our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now, rather we fix our our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. What's he saying? Suffering results in glory. Not our glory, be it, but God's glory. Think about the people that you've read about, that you've heard about, that you've talked to, who suffered because they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ or tried to. I'm a subscriber to Spotify, and each day... There's a program called 365 Christian Men on that, on that application. And they say that their goal is to inspire and encourage with real life stories about men. And, and there are some that are just excellent. One episode that I heard this week talked about an Ecuadorian man by the name of Chemo. He was the, 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 the main uh, subject of this particular broadcast. He's from a very remote tribe in Ecuador that were named the Naked Savages. And you've probably heard about Jim Elliott. But do you remember a guy named Nate Saint who was Jim Elliott's pilot when he was killed? The story goes that Nate and Jim and three other missionaries went to this tribe and they they had made contact with them by dropping them presents from his aircraft and they even gave presents back and they tried to, to connect with them and to share the gospel. And yet the theory of this tribe was anybody who comes into our space will be speared. And that's exactly what happened to those five missionaries on that morning uh, in 1956. They tried to share the gospel message with Chemo and the other warriors that were surrounding them. And yet all they did was spear them to death. And yet the way that Elliot and Saint and all these other missionaries died. And the fact that that Nate Saint's sister herself would come back to them a few years later and share the gospel with them led people like Chemo to say, you know what? I want what they have. And so he became a Christ follower. Jump ahead eight years from 1956. Marge Saint and her two kids go back to the river where her husband and their father was killed by this man, Chemo, and these other warriors. Chemo had been a believer for a number of years now, and they went back to the place where their dad and their husband had died for one purpose so that saints two kids could be baptized in the river where their dad had died. And guess who baptized them? Chemo. There's glory in that story. There's no question about it. To whose glory? Jim Elliott's? Nate Saint, chemo, no, to God. Because these men and women were willing to do whatever they had to do to let the glory of God shine out of their lives. Dads, men. It's hard being a dad nowadays. I think it's always been hard, but it just seems to be harder today. I don't know why. 
sometimes dad take this, takes, we take this posture that says, man, we've got to be perfect. We've super dad. We have to do everything. And you know what? Our kids look at us and they say, yeah, I, I know who you really are. So dad, maybe what we need to do is to allow our kids, no matter what age they are, and allow others to see the cracks in us, to see our flaws, to see our imperfections, and just maybe the light of Christ, the, the glory of God will shine out of us and people will respond. That's not just for dads, that's for all of us. So may we never give up. That's how Paul started the chapter. He ended the chapter. Never give up on letting the glory of God shine through you.